Anybody who paid less than eighty dollars to park today? <laughs> Talk about piracy. This is a good way to start off. Um, John Lafitte is the most famous pirate in Texas. All right, he's the only pirate in Texas, but he is the most famous pirate in, in Texas as well. And, and he's actually the most famous pirate of note during the 19th century. Those of you who know anything about piracy may know the golden age of piracy is about a century earlier, and it's, it's over. Uh, what we have here is a, a little echo of, of something that was made possible um, for political reasons, I'll go into that in, in a bit. The, the whole idea of what we find <coughs> Jean Lafitte gets to be a footnote to history because of the War of 1812 and the Battle of New Orleans. And, and that, that's the truth. Uh, the rest of it is legend and lies and, and, and truth. But, but you know, most of you people who are John Ford fans and you know, who had a shot at Liberty Bells, turns out that. Um, <coughs> Jimmy Stewart didn't, didn't shoot when he got And at the end of the movie, after they've gone through the whole story, they say, oh, they're talking to a newspaper editor, and he said, the day before, he said, well, what are you going to print? And he said, uh, sir, this is the West, and when the facts contradict the legend, we print the legend. <laughs> <laughs> Fake news. Lafitte <laughs> <laughs> uh, would make uh, Steel Window Kitty and J. Frank Doley, the Dean of Texas Folklorist. Here you see him in a naval uniform of the, of the period. And there is absolutely no evidence that he would have worn a naval uniform. You know, when, when, when they were trying to fight the Battle of New Orleans, they didn't say, okay, let's let's take measurements and sizes for find well, out who's going to uh, be wearing the naval uniforms. Uh, he probably never saw the inside of the naval uniform, although he did see the outside, and that's part of the story as well. Uh, Lafitte is an interesting character in lots of ways. So one is that he's part of a, a brother team, of Jean and Pierre. Uh, now, most people don't know about Pierre Lafitte, his, but coming, I, I live in Galveston, I teach at A&M in Galveston, I taught up until last May when they I finally got rid of me after 46 years. <laughs> I was terminated. Uh, but the, uh, the, in Galveston, the Maceo brothers uh, ran Galveston during the, the Sin City days, and it was Sam and Rose Maceo. Sam was the face. Um, Mace, the Rose Maceo, Sario uh, Maceo, was in the county house counting out the money. He was the, he was the, he was the enforcer. He was the, he was the brains behind the organization. Uh, some people think that that's how it worked here, but a number of historians believe that Jean actually is the face of, of, of the pirate operation or privateering operation, and that the, his, his brother Pierre is the brains behind the organization. Um, what we have is a sense of a sense of, of history that leads us to the, the, the life of, of Lafitte. He, he, he was born around 1780 or so, uh, and died around 1823 or so, and like or so from 1823 to 1854, or about that late. That's old. Even for office, that's a long death. <laughs> <laughs> His, his career is in the second decade of the 19th century, and that's, that's where he was. And he's, he's, he's part of the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and you can see the way that it, it works in this particular. Thing. There's, there's Galveston Island, and uh, up north somewhere is that other city, uh, Houston. Isn't it amazing? Houston is such, such a big maritime city, it's not even on the water. That's a, that's, a, that's a problem that people in Galveston have. Uh, but Galveston Island, New Orleans and Grand Terre, Barry Perry and I have islands in Bay, beneath there, and uh, the Yucatan, the island of the women, the Islam, that's Mohammed, and uh, that's, that's the area that the Lafitte's come 
too. They came from probably Hispaniola. Uh, they always claimed to have been born in France, but if you were in New Orleans, French citizenship would get you a leg up even uh, legally in terms of what laws you were subject to. So taking the word of, of a pirate group or of, of someone who exists in illegality is, is, is not necessarily the best way to get there. But that's a lot of what we know, we think we know. A lot of it is, is the legend that John Ford has us reading about. Uh, it's as murky as the back border of the Bayou's south of Louisiana. Where, where does it go? In which direction does the water flow, and how does it how does it operate? Where do, where do they come? We know that the Louisiana Purchase is 1803. Uh, we know that that in 1812 uh, that Jean and Pierre Lippy first appeared in the registry, that they were arrested. And Jean was called the boss. And so there's a sense that he probably was there before that time. He probably had time to establish what he was doing. The, the, the two brothers, essentially, regardless of what you're going to we, we'll, we'll talk about pirating or privateering, uh, they run a smuggling operation. And that's the notion. What you do is you get goods as cheaply as possible. And by the way, stealing them from the Spanish is really cheap. <laughs> that's, that's good. And then you sell it without having to pay any uh, custom taxes on it. And that's, that's a part. The United States doesn't really mind much when people steal from Spain. Uh, Spain is, is weak men of Europe. It's still around and, and in this part of the hemisphere. Uh, we'd like to get rid of them. Uh, and so any, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Uh, so in some sense, what these guys are doing, good work for the United States and, and as they're hitting Spanish shipping. Well, the Feats always claimed that they went up to Spanish shipping because they had a, a, some kind of a grudge in, in the past and they never touched American shipping. They were always uh, good uh, democracy people. They, were, they couldn't stand the monarchy in, in, in Spain. But I think a lot of it has to do with, with, with Willie Sutton. They said, well, why do you rob banks? Well, that's where the money was. Uh, and for why would you go after Spain? That's where the money was. Spain's way of colonization was essentially uh, raping the world, taking all the stuff out of it, putting it on ships, and, and, and so they moved back and forth, and there'd be valuable things to get because they were taking it to or from the old country, and then all the, all the goods were flowing in that direction. We don't really know much about Lafitte, but there is a photograph that exists uh, Liberty, Texas, you know, not, not, not far, it's a little bit to the east. There's a, there's a great library in Lepidiana. And there's the, uh, this, this drawing of Jean Lepid, page 22, and it says it, it was made by, uh, from an original sketch made in 1804. That, that may be true when there, there he is looking uh, tall. I mean, a lot of people mentioned how tall he was, over six feet. I call the early 1800s, uh, small heads and feet. And the small heads and feet were a mark of nobility. Uh, by the way, I have a size 12 feet, so I, I, I don't qualify for it. But John Lafitte would have had that. He also had, he spoke with a foreign foreign accent and could speak in languages like Spanish, French, and English, uh, moving back and forth fairly easily, maybe mostly. After a while, if you do business, and still today, you do business in America, trade, you know more than one language, you have to buy from and sell to. And those are two good languages to know, even if it's not the one that you've grown up in. Uh, there is, there's, there's been a lot of publishing on, on the Right after he died, uh, there, there were novelizations, fictionalizations. He's very romantic, and I understand romantic is, is a good word to use in terms of the early 19th century because it's in the romantic field was in, in, uh, in England, and the transcendentalism is in the United States pretty much the same thing. The, the, the notion of someone who was misunderstood, who 
was an outlaw and an outlaw who would be good. Probably not. There's a romantic take on being an outlaw, someone who doesn't obey the law. Show the feet was in that direction. There's the pirate's own book, the, the green one, that shows uh, it's purported to have been written by the pirates themselves, but not so. They, they are there are a number of interesting stories among them. The Lafitte story. Um, there are there's even a, a journal of John Lafitte, which also was in Liberty of Texas. So fella came. Hawking claimed to be the uh, great grandson of Sean Murphy in the 1940s. And uh, Governor Price Daniel uh, was quite interested in the journal and the Bible and the letters. Didn't laugh while he was in office as governor, but he used an agent to, to buy him and donated it to the library. And it's there. It's been, it's been translated into English. Uh, the, the big and still maybe the best written of all is the one on the bottom left by Lyle Saxon, it's Lafitte the Pirate. Uh, it's, it's a historical fiction or fictional history. Uh, people who want to read Saxon get a lot of that information and, and he wasn't helping uh, or he couldn't help. He just he, he, he put it in there. Uh, a lot of his information is used in uh, Ramsey's book, John Lafitte, Prince of Pirates, and 2005, the most scholarly of all the books, uh, The Pirates of Feet, uh, Trek of This World, Your Corsairs, William C. Davis. Um, that wonderful book, about 400 pages long, and uh, about 150 of them off footnotes. I, I love it. I, I, I love reading the footnotes. But you know what? A lot of the footnotes are in here's the document you can find. It's a lot of the footnotes is this person said this, and that's why I, I've written it. It's, well, it's based on hearsay, but you know, understand we're in an underreported, simultaneously underreported in terms of facts and overreported in terms of legend. Uh, and what we end up with is people say, Oh, yeah, I knew the feet, right? I should go down to Galveston by the way. I, 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 the feet and I, we were, you know, we were like this. I, I know him and, and one of his wives. There are lots of stories, and a lot of the stories were told. I, I teach a, a class called Literature of the Sea, and one of the things I do is a little bit of North folklore. And uh, among the things I like best, I like to come up with original images that are kind of fun to look at and uh, original documents. And I found this, this uh, Granada stamp, and this is Jean Lafitte, it's identified as Jean Lafitte, and there he is. Right? What exactly he's standing on, I'm not sure. <laughs> and I looked at it and said, you know, I've seen that image before. It looks, it looks familiar. <laughs> this is from the Pirates on the Book. And you can see what he's standing on now. He's standing on the deck, and there are the people dying left and right. And, uh, by the way, what he's wearing there is probably more like what he would have worn uh, at the time rather than a real uniform. So uh, what I can say about Granada is that they pirated the image. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, there you go. All right. Anybody recognize? Uh, all right. Somebody. I guess you know, nobody's old enough anymore. But uh, in 1926, in Dallas Morning News, started started to publish a comic strip called Texas History Movie. And they, they were immensely popular. They were about Texas history and all, all the adventures and just a lot of it made up, but all of it very, very interesting and dramatic. Uh, it was such a, a wonderful deal that, that he, in the 1930s, uh, it was picked up by a Magnolia Petroleum Company. They brought it and they called it this book at one and distributed it in three to the school children in Texas. So if you were in middle school, uh, during the 40s or the 50s, some early 50s, uh, there's a good chance that you learn about Texas history out of the comic book. But before you knock it, understand that when graphic novels are really in today and graphic nonfiction, that knowing history, having a sense of it, uh, 
it's probably more important than the meaning of religion in faith. The idea that people would actually read this. And by the way, if you find a, a copy of this at a used bookstore, buy it. It's worth something nowadays. It's no longer free. So I've got, I've got some good images from that. Uh, I, here's Jean Lafitte saying, I take this from the name of the Republic of Mexico. Uh, the captain says, never heard of that, and the comment at the bottom of his business was fine. Um, difference between a pirate and a private Jew? Walmart is sanctioned by the state of the country. Yeah, yeah, right. All right. You go into Walmart, and, and you uh, just before you walk out with the goods, you sw swipe your phone and, and, the, and the, or, or your credit card. You are a customer. If you walk out without paying, you're a shoplifter. That's you still got the goods out there. And by the way, if you stole the credit card, uh, that's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just as much of a thief for that one. Uh, privateers had letters of mark, and they are Q U E. Uh, letters of mark and reprisal. Uh, essentially, with that one, a country at war with another country, and maybe the more exactly a country. Uh, no, this is this, there are more people sitting over here. So this is a real country. This is a jerk for the nation here. They, uh, they're just getting together. They're, they're, they decide, oh, let, let's let's see if we, uh, let's declare war against this big country. Uh, but we don't have enough money to have a navy. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody comes out and says, I got a boat. Uh, I'll, I'll take their ships and, and capture them. And, and you say, sure, let me write you out a little, a little permission slip. And that's, that's been dialed in down to the way the letters of Mark were written. And we, by the way, before you say, oh, that's awful, what do you think the greatest naval victories in the Revolutionary War and, and the War of 1812 were from? Not the United States Navy, but essentially from privateers. Privateering was legal international up until the middle part of, of the century, and then by the end of the century, it's, uh, it is, it, it's, it's gone. Uh, but it, the idea of Stealing something and showing them, is, I have permission to steal, uh, and, and, or not showing them that, doesn't make much difference to the poor captain who's just lost all his goods. And that's where what we always claim to be a privateer. There's a good reason to claim to be a privateer. Uh, piracy is a capital offense. You, you, if you are caught and convicted of piracy, you can be executed. If you are caught and convicted of privateering, you can be held as a prisoner of war. Um, well, I don't know which one I would want to pick. Uh, he was, he, in, in New Orleans, uh, New Orleans is an important, an important city. Uh, it's at, right at the end and uh, the money end of the Mississippi River. It controls all the commerce. Uh, there's lots of big business there, and by the way, if you're in the business of stealing and smuggling, you need to have somebody to sell it to. You, you need a fence, uh, and that's what New Orleans was. It was a place where these goods could go into. But, so, we're coming up to an election. It's a small election, although it used to be pretty contested. But, no, elections are important. Government is always saying we need support. No, people don't always understand that governments don't have any money. We have the money. And well, the governments do is say, would you pay some money to me? And, and just because you're sweet or because I threatened you with imprisonment, if you don't pay the money, I get tax money. Or uh, in terms of, of goods coming in, I get custom duty. <laughs> and that's essentially the way that New Orleans is funded through custom duty. Uh, if, if you have pirates who come in, or smugglers who come in and don't pay the excise taxes, that means the government is getting a fair share. Uh, and, and you get a better deal. You get to buy your Rolex watch for only fifty dollars instead of uh, fifty thousand. Uh, that's a really good deal, but the government doesn't get any money at all. Uh, so finally, the government says we got we got we got to put an end to this. And this is this is from Lyle Saxon. Uh, that he finally offers a reward for, not the head of John Lafitte, but uh, for, for the capture uh, and anything leading to the imprisonment of, of John Lafitte, uh, $500 reward. And the, uh, the next morning, counter posters appeared throughout New Orleans since 
tax, and, and they had anywhere from uh, two thousand dollars to the six fifteen thousand dollars reward for the head of the county claim. Probably you know, we had more money than claim board. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, said no, I, it was it was a joke. I, 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 I would never want any harm to come to the good governor Claiborne. There were rumors, by the way, that uh, Governor Claiborne's wife and John Lafitte knew each other. This used to be in the Cabildo in New Orleans. It's uh, uh, an early uh, uh, oil color, and the, their orange, the Lafitte brothers are in a kind of orangey uh, background. In the, in the front, holding up the glass of Jean Lafitte and his brother Pierre. Now, Pierre did not have that same kind of uh, status. He had suffered some kind of a, it was a stroke, and he. He was kind of bent over. He just he walked with a stoop, uh, and so he, he wasn't the face of, of piracy. But the, the, there, there they are in the background. And if you, uh, this is at least as close to being a, an authentic by people who actually knew the feet as, as almost any image we have. And the other image, by the way, the first one I showed you, uh, that was published in the Lyle Saxon book, and it was it, it appears on. Place settings and napkins from here in New Orleans, so, but it doesn't really have any any, any claim to authenticity. All right, the Battle of New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans is up. I was. It, it's it's where the money is. It's where the people who have the money live, and uh, Barry, the Barry Carrot Islands are outside. Outside the jurisdiction, you know, it, 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 during the Fourth of July, it's illegal to shoot up fireworks in the city of Houston. So all you have to do is find a jurisdiction where it's legal, uh, or an outside, or something that's kind of not in anybody's jurisdiction. Uh, once you get outside of Galveston, or just if you see on just north of Galveston on I-45, there are wonderful opportunities to see women barely clothed, or or even less than barely clothed, uh, and it's not in the city. The city can't really do anything to those places out there. And that's why it's good to be in, in those islands, in the, in, the, in the swamps. Also, it's a good place to hide out. On the other hand, if nobody knows where they are. Uh, how are you going to come to my auctions when I hold them? And that, that was a little part of it. Everybody knew where it was. But it was they, the Balinese ballroom, when, when they were the Texas Rangers were, were planning to raid it. Uh, they got the local sheriff and they said, come on, we'll go in. And he said, no, I, I, I don't have a membership. I can't. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, the notion of what people actually do know and is, well, when Clay Brown says it's illegal, nobody should smuggle, he's talking to people whose brothers, fathers, grandfathers smuggled. It's the way in, in, a, in an era after the, after the Revolutionary War, when it's hard to get goods into the hinterlands, uh, how else do you get this stuff? I think uh, Britain wasn't allowing the, the ships to come in. So it's, it's, it's why we go to the big box stores. Even though a lot of the retail stores are, are, are doing badly as opposed to Amazon.com, the ones that are, that are working out are, are places like Ross and Marshalls and, and places with, that offer discounts. People still want to go to Tuesday morning. Uh, they don't necessarily want to go to the places that charge retail price. And what do you mean? Good retail price there. The British are fighting the War of 1812. Well, they're not fighting the War of 1812. They're fighting the Napoleonic War. But then the, the so-called War of 1812 is, is a kind of a, a, a backwater war. But it's, it's connected with it and it's at the same time. If they can control the Mississippi River, and they, they try it at the northern end and they try it here at the southern end, they can do it. They can put up the western and the east. 
and uh, make it difficult to get goods back and forth uh, and, and down the, the, up and down the river. And that will mean the cotton doesn't do so well, it doesn't matter if they also travel, it won't do so well. And that will give them a leg up. And that's, that, they, they're the deal. That's what, that's what they're thinking in 1840 when they, when they come into New Orleans. Uh, the, the British Navy offers, well, as, as John Lafitte's letter, and by the way, with the John Lafitte actually used a skull and crossbones as his letterhead stationary, I don't know, but that's the comic book we're reading. Uh, September 4th, 1814. Yesterday, the British offered me 30,000 pounds in a boat to join the British Navy. My heart is with the United States. If you will promise freedom for my men and me, we will join the United States in this war. Refer the promise never to act as pirates again, son John Lafitte. Now, that's a, a simplified version of it. Lafitte never used the word pirate in relation to himself. Uh, he, he said, I'm, I've never done that, I'm not a pirate. Uh, but his, essentially, that was, that was the deal. They came in and they offered him all sorts of things, not just the money, but they offered him uh, a piece of the action. Once they broke up the United States to control of New Orleans and it became theirs, uh, he could be uh, the, the mayor of, and, and own as much as they were willing to give. And that's that's a pretty heady deal. Um, Lafitte's response, you now remember the audience is, of course, he's sending it to Governor Claiborne, <coughs> who he doesn't have a really good relationship with. Uh, he's sending it to the officials, the constabulary. His, his, uh, it's couched in words that said, my heart is with the United States. You know, I'm in favor of democracy. And, and, and by the way, the smuggling pirate the operations are probably more democratic than most of the governmental operations going on. People own shares in what they were doing. Uh, it's, it's, maybe there is a sense in which you know, Jean Lafitte is in favor of democracy. There's also a possibility that it's just like all, all the good uh, betting money knows that it's, it's, it's not the uh, the Washington Nationals out of the team that goes back to <laughs> but, but, but Not just Mac and I both have millions of dollars out there. <laughs> well, and you might know that that's exactly what, that the, the, the way to do it is, is to go with the United States because eventually it's a guerrilla warfare and the guerrillas are going to win. Uh, the, the, the country that's a long way away has to fight the war so far away, it's, they're, they're never going to make it. Uh, now, Claiborne trusts Lafitte as far as he can throw him, but look at the letter he, he, he comes back to. We value you and your men, join us at once in the world, and some pass will be forgiven, provided you never resume your trade as a pirate. Uh, Henry Jackson was in New Orleans, and uh, he called the Lafitte's band Hellish Banditti. That's the right quotation. Uh, and then when he discovered that they didn't have enough lips to light up the powder, and that the barbarians did, then he called them gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Politics make strange bedfellows. Uh, we don't have an authentic picture uh, when it matters are still. We do have an authentic movie made of, of John Lafitte. Here he is looking a lot like a uh, young Frederick March uh, in The Buccaneer, 1938, the black and white uh, Cecily DeMille production. Oh, you, uh, and, and the later they decided to do it over again in color 20 years later. Uh, the director was Anthony Quinn. Anybody know who he was married to? Cecil B. DeMille's daughter. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Cecil B. DeMille had a call, and, and so he, he, he gave uh, it to Quinn. And there's the old Brenner in it, too. Uh, Brenner was never bald entirely. He, he did have a, a receding hairline, uh, but he, he shaved his head and at that time, so he, he appeared in, 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 a, in a suit. Uh, now there is the, the pardon signed by James Madison, full pardon, uh, on condition that you no longer buy your trade. Now, there's, that's great. This means you can walk the streets of New Orleans now, you're not a prescribed criminal. But here, young man, uh, that's your trade. <laughs> what are you going to do? Are you Walmart? I mean, there's, and some of the, some of the, the, the barricarians stayed behind in New Orleans, and they, 
they set up shop and they did the legal sorts of things. But just, you may not know this, the profit margin in criminality is much higher. Than <laughs> 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 well, so the reward for the distinguished service was okay, and uh, it's time to lay out for the wilderness, and that's West. And that's where Galveston comes in. Uh, there's Galveston, this idea was better than Barry Perry, let's take it to Jean Lafitte. John's got the idea, he's always right at the conference, they're, they're talking over what they're going to do, and uh, they're there. They're an act of loyalty to the non-existent Republic of Mexico. There is no Republic of Mexico, but you folks decided that you wanted to be the Republic of Mexico, that's fine, so they write their letters of mark and, and uh, we'll, we'll buy it. Galveston is essentially an island very far from Mexico City and very far from New Orleans. Actually, not that far from New Orleans. Closer to New Orleans than Mexico City. I still need New Orleans. I want to get out of New Orleans because I can't stand the constabulary now. Uh, <laughs> this place is filled with naval officers. I, you can't, uh, uh, what's a good honest criminal going to do with New Orleans? Not much. <laughs> but in Galveston, uh, far away from the prying eyes of everybody, we, we can accomplish it. And that's why Galveston is there. It's there because it's far away from and close to New Orleans. It's the fine body business to New Orleans. A lot of the goods get walked over or shipped over to New Orleans. Eighteen sixteen. Uh, there's a map uh, and Isla Serpiente, Snake Island. Of course, the only name for Galveston. <coughs> Look at all those lakes and rivers in, in Galveston. What happened to them? Use and ship channel happened to them, uh, and among, among other things. The, uh, first of all, the, 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 the Galveston hurricane meant that Galveston was going to raise their land or disappear, and they did that. They raised the level of one seventeen feet, and then a lot of the stuff gets filled in. And then uh, Houston saw its opportunity, uh, tried to build its port, and had to dredge out the ship channel. Where do you put all that dirt? Good spot, right over here, Pelican Island. My campus, by the way, is in Pelican Island. My campus is here in Pelican Island. Uh, there is no dirt in, in 1860. And so, so it's a dredge soil operation. By the way, I gave this talk to some, somebody from the port of Houston who said, Excuse me, so we don't call it dredge soil, we call it opportunity reclamation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the young people that were there were the Columbia, the native, and they, they had a reputation for, well, for having dinner with people. <laughs> <laughs> And, and by the way, the reputation is almost always is exaggerated. I think lots of native uh, peoples have ritual cannibalism, but it's, it's not like going to McDonald's and asking for a happy meal. It, it, it's not subsistence diet, it's something else entirely. Uh, this is what Galveston or Kentichi uh, looks like, the camp, uh, in, let's say, 1818. Uh, uh, and there's Essentially, it's, it's a port. Uh, John Lafitte is not a swash and, and, and buckle kind of a pirate. He's more organized crime. You know the, the reason we have organized crime in the United States? It's because we outlawed liquor. And everybody loves liquor. And everybody was willing to, to look the other way. To, and, uh, and then that was a great deal of profit and essentially we created organized crime with a, with a scoop of law uh, that lasted for a while, and they're, they're, that's kind of happened with the, with the laws against smuggling, and especially uh, the interesting a law that tragically was intended to get rid of slavery. Uh, there was, there was no, a law against importation of slaves, and what that meant was that, you know, the Lafitte brothers hit spend slave ships, they could turn those slaves in as contraband, 
get half the price and then buy them back at auction and they'd be no longer imported to slaves but, but homegrown. And uh, so essentially what the law, the law against the importation of slavery down in Margo did was create a stronger market for uh, and more money. In it. Uh, you, you can see there's a, a lot of it is, is cell cloth and, and wood left over from ships, but there's a, a there's Maison Rouge um, the, where the tower facing the bay. Uh, there's a gibbet, somebody hanging from it. Uh, there are people taking in each other's laundry. It's a growing community. There's an inn. There was even uh, people described a billiard table. I think if you go down to Galveston, um, um, what was the port industrial <coughs> park side right now? You, you can see this area that's called what may have been uh, Maison Rouge, but that, that structure has nothing to do with Maison Rouge. It was uh, built in 1885 um, and it was rented out for multi purpose in the 1940s. Uh, that was built on top of something that was built on top of what may have been made on the roof. Finally, the United States says, you got to get out. Um, the, the deal is, remember I told you, we really like piracy. You know, we, we like the idea that the Lafitte's are going after the Spanish shipping. But every once in a while, somebody hits an American ship. So that's not so good. And the other thing is that the adams onis Treaty, which is, is between the United States and Spain, is for, we want Spain to get out of uh, Florida. We've already got one part of Florida, we want the rest of it, and we're willing to give up everything on the west side of the Sabine River. That's where I have a finger across the kind of back of saying that. Uh, you remember when they were giving the, that cloth of loyalty, a number of them had their fingers crossed and their fingers up their nose, they, or the holding their left hand up to take the oath of loyalty. In, in this, this sense, what uh, the United States was in favor of it, the American government ratified it, both houses of Congress ratified it, but Spain dragged their feet on it, and they complained about the feet, and so it was time to get rid of the mosquito. Uh, so the Navy comes in, and oh, the Lafitte's got nice little boats. I, I was interviewed by uh, somebody for a television show, uh, 10 Things You Don't Know About Texas, and uh, one of the facts was that Lafitte had more, had more ships than the American Navy. And that's true, but his ships were this big, and their ships were that big. Uh, their ships had much bigger guns, and if there were a battle, their ships would have blown his ships out of the water. Uh, there's no way he can stand up to the Navy. He, he says he's going to leave, and this is around 1820, 1821. He leaves, and then he dies in 1823 off the, the Yucatan. Or, or not. Uh, and a little bit later, he, he goes to uh, South Carolina and marries his childhood sweetheart. Uh, Emma Mortimer, and they move up to uh, San Luis, Missouri, and then he es establishes a gunpowder manufacturing plant in Alton, Illinois, just across the river, and then dies once again in 1854. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's, the, that's the journal, uh, the, 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 the post story about what, what happens, and that's, if you, 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 that's what's, what's in there. What, what this fellow, John Andershin, who said he was a retired railroad worker, and by the way, the, re fairly recently, uh, the Lafitte Society in Galveston investigated in him, not Lafitte, and discovered that he never was a retired railroad worker. So he was a con man. By the way, that doesn't mean that what he's selling wasn't the real thing. It just means that he was a con man. Uh, and he wasn't necessarily the related to uh, Jean Laughlin at all. Uh, there is a, there's a tombstone in Alton, Illinois for uh, John Laughlin, and that's, but there are people who go out and make a pilgrimage to that. They, that's where he is, is, is buried. The, the notion that he was uh, a 
the manufacturing of gunpowder was still a very nice, nice notion, uh, a, a way to end their life as a, as a criminal, uh, doing something illegal, uh, or working them out. Uh, there's not only are there photographs, that's, that's a big air attack on, on, on the one glass, and, and you can see all the things and others. But there they are, uh, what Mr. McClellan comes in, uh, it's, it's, it's about buying slaves. And remember, the underside of this, they're, they're dealing with things like crystal and linen and cowl, <laughs> a lot of good stuff. But they are also dealing in human flesh. The yo-ho-ho -ho theory of piracy is, is a lot of fun, but it, it's not necessarily the, the, the full truth. But it's not that the Lafitte is the only person involved. The Bowie brothers, including uh, the St. James Bowie, uh, they, that's how he made most of his money, slavery. Uh, and they, he, he, he worked with, with Lafitte, and the inside, there was more money in people than there was in, in the others, in the other commodities. Now, I guess it's, 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 you, know, you can't find anything about, uh, about the feet that's, that's honest. I, I wish I could find some song or, or anything about the feet. And I was doing some work at the Roosevelt Library in Dallas, the oldest library in Texas. Uh, it's, it's got a, a, a great archive. And uh, in the archive, I found it's in the Pirate Isle of Memorial. So, oh, great, it's wonderful. And I, I, I went out and, and found it. And uh, the, well, it, it worked like this. Here's the, here's the, the first verse. Tis the semi-centennial of which we boast, a dear old gal of the skin and the gem of the coast. Which once was the home of the pirates of feet, where now the Texas proud queen of commerce does sit. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, it's a crummy commercial. And then these dunderheads can't even rhyme with feet and sit, which is what I said when I, the first time I gave the talk after finding that. In the back of the room, there are a couple of raising hands, but the show be our French Canadians, and this is a fit and sit. Oh, I, I, I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out, actually, they were right, and I was wrong. Lafit La, La does rhyme with Sid, and that's how Lafit La is. And it's the, also the, the notion of, of uh, his name and how it's spelled. It, it, are there two Fs or two Ts? And most people have spelled it with two Ts, but Recently, since the Davis book, come, more and more people are spelling with two Fs and one T. Um, but you know, those of you who have done genealogy probably have misspelled names going back as, as far as you can remember. And remember, uh, the other thing is that we live next to the Battle of San Jacinto, like the great Spanish J. Can you hear it? Yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, recently I've heard a lot of people calling it the San Jacinto. It, it's possible with that. Uh, the most liquid part of any language is pronunciation. That is kind of going to Well, uh, I also, I, that sort of didn't work out, but I, so I, I asked for another, and I, I did find one. Uh, this, this song was written in 1959 by Jimmy Driftwood, sung by Johnny Horton uh, for the film Good Tape of January. And I, 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 I had known the song because it, it was played on the AM radio. Any of you old enough to remember when there was music on the AM radio? <laughs> <laughs> it was played on the AM radio. It was a top 40 song. Um, but I, yeah, I never heard any, any such uh, thing. It turned out that Driftwood was a history teacher in high school, and, and he wrote this 18-verse uh, song uh, to teach the kids a little bit of history, and it had uh, Jean Lafitte in it. Well, in 1814, we took a little trip along Jackson down in my Mississippi. We took a little bacon and we took a little beans and we caught the blood of British in California. Once more, we'll make it to the run. Down the Mississippi to the 
Todo me siento. Yo suppose when we'll see Morris Jackson come on walking down the street, walking to a park by the name of John the Dean. Gave John the Dean Daddy from Tennessee. Daddy helped a pirate that brought the British to the sea. That's it. That's the only part of the song. <laughs> into the history books, and that's the reason why he has a name and people like Michelle Corey don't. They, there were some pirates then, uh, but mostly international piracy had been squelched by uh, the British and, and its long naval reach. Uh, what we have here is a, just a, a little bullet that aligned itself more with privateering than with piracy. Uh, yeah, you know, you can't find everything. I tried and just didn't, didn't make it. Uh, but what, what happened when Lafitte leaves Galveston? Uh, well, the story goes that he said, I have buried my treasure under three trees. Now, like any good pirate, X marks the spot, and X in this case is, is three trees. Why he would have told people that he buried his treasure in the three trees is beyond me. Uh, and also, the notion of pirates burying treasure. You know, I've got a cousin and she likes to gamble. Uh, you know when she stops gambling? Yeah. She runs out of money. <laughs> <laughs> she runs out of money. One time she actually was ahead and she had a bucket full of quarters. And her, her husband saw the bucket and he said, what is that, Peggy? And she told him that he drove back and they lost that too. That's, that's what pirates do. Pirates don't think about the future, they think about the present. I, I think the, the notion of pirate buried treasure is, uh, is fraudulent. I, I believe that most of the buried treasure, there is a buried treasure, of course, and, and ships that are sunk, and that they didn't intend to bury them there, but that's how they <laughs> So, the three trees are the feet grow. So I used to end it here, and just say, uh, well, you know, that's, that's about all I can do. I'm sorry, folks. And, uh, and somebody said, well, well, Dr. Curley, if you can't find the song, can't, can't, can't you write your own? And I said, moi? Which is French for, why the hell not? <laughs> self-respecting folk musician would do. I stole it from somebody else. <laughs> I, I took it from Woody Guthrie, so let me say good to know you. Oh, Woody, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but um, I discovered he stole it too. Originally, it's a ballad of Jesse James, uh, and I thought, I want to show you, don't be the kid. And I thought, what a great prominence for, uh, for a pirate song. To be stolen twice and start out as a a Billy the Kid song. There it is. This is called Three Keys. My name is Jean Lafitte, I'm a pirate, they say. From civilization, I must sail away. But that's all I don't believe. What you hear, a pirate, I'm not just a poor privateer. Fire. 
I, I didn't want, I didn't, didn't know you had ringers here for this song. Anyway, um, Ghost Rose. <laughs> States government in, in, in the Arkansas Territory, uh, going around surveying it, looking at it, and he's fine for Spain. And, and his secret his secret number was was thirteen. And, uh, the theaters was so they were they were secret agents. So they had, probably the United States government knew about it and they they let it go on. But there it was. These were double agents. Uh, they were they were able. They didn't, make, they didn't make that much money out of either, either one. So it, it didn't work out. And that's kind of the way of what the story of, of, of pirateering, pirateering and privateering in the 19th century, that there's not much money in it. Um, of course, by the way, those of you who know about the South China Seas and, and the modern day pirates of the whole one would be a different story there. And, and what, Jeff? Yeah, the two quick questions. The Lafitte's Cove on the Galaxy, is that a historical term or is that something that all of us? Oh, um, well, that, you know, a lot of it is a good thing there, but you want to understand, Lafitte leaves Galveston in 1821. Galveston becomes a city in 1839. So that's not that long after. The, and not, not just because Lafitte left, doesn't mean that everybody in the family. Uh, some people decided to, to start families that stay in the area, uh, and, and Galveston becomes an incorporated city in, in 1839. So people, they probably they had memories of just like you had memories of your grandparents, but probably you and I don't know much about our great grandparents. Uh, I, I think they used to live here or, or there. So a lot of that is is um, conjectural. <coughs> it's based on on memories which some of which may be faulty. They, uh, that that area may, there, there was a fight of, of, of the Battle of Three Trees. Three Trees uh, gets in here a number of times between the pirates and the, and the Caribbean Indians. And of course the pirates win, but, but I mean, that's, if you're in the business of smuggling, you don't really want to fight with your neighbors. Uh, so the, the area, that, that area is, um, is the whole, the, the whole notion of Galveston in, in that area, they had boats and they would sail in and out. So they're probably, he and his men set foot in most of what 